Welcome to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Vantage Circle, the leading employee benefits and engagement platform. Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. And today I'm excited to have Amber Vanderberg, who's an award-winning international business person, coach and speaker. She's named as Tulsa's 40 under 40, Oklahoma's 30 under 30, and three-time SHRM award winner. Amber is a former HR director that has implemented best business practices in organizations, small and large, domestically and abroad with a passion for mobilizing ideas and equipment teams to exceed goals. In 2016, Amber was the only female and only American Academy uh, elite football coach for the Adidas Game Day Academy uh, in, in, in uh, Bangalore, India. She worked with international team of coaches to transform the organizational design, training development and culture uh, corporate culture to cultivate a high performing team today. Uh, Amber is the founder of Ninja Group that works with international teams in a ninja approach to collaborate uh, uh, for collaboration, creativity and captainship to catapult organization performance to all inspiring standards. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Amber. Thank you so much for having me, Rohit. I'm very glad to be here. Awesome. So, you know, um, how did you get into HR? What, what got you excited to be in, in this field of HR? Yeah, so HR is actually a little bit more of a family affair for me. Uh, so my uh, father was involved in HR and then my aunt was involved in HR. And so whenever it came time for me to progress in my field of study, I uh, was very much drawn to this field. And I really came to realize that, you know, we spend more time with our work families than we do our actual families. And life is too short to be at a place that is not um, enjoyable to be at. And HR really has the power to make a difference and uh, transform the, the way that we work into a place that's more enjoyable and uh, fun to be at. Awesome. So, you know, uh, today I want to talk about performance feedback and that seems to be one of your favorite topics. And, uh, you know, I wanted to understand how frequently should a, should a leader give performance feedback and, you know, we, we're recording at the times of uh, COVID-19, you know, so uh, where, you know, you're not physically allowed to touch people, uh, people not going back to offices, it looks like till, till December, uh, 2020 people would not be going back to office. How would a leader give a performance feedback and, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So there isn't a special formula for exactly how many times you should give formal and informal, uh, but it is, it is important to recognize that there are two major types of feedback and that is formal feedback, meaning a formal sit down review. It could be something written. Uh, and then there's also informal feedback. And that's generally what we see maybe in the office, walking by and saying, good job. As you said, right now we are, uh, most of us are working remotely. And so what I find is that when it comes to formal types of feedback, uh, I really meet with the leadership team and decide what is going to be the best uh, frequency. So for some teams, it might be once a year. Uh, for other teams, uh, it could be quarterly, it could be monthly. Um, the important thing is to really identify the purpose of giving the frequency of feedback. I'll give you an example. I was working with one team and they were giving quarterly feedback and they decided to give monthly feedback. And the reason was, is there were some performance issues. What we found is that the issue wasn't exactly the feedback. It was the systems that we were working under. And so we actually went back to the quarterly feedback and then created better systems so that we could have intervals within those quarters to have improvement and to um, really practice the um, uh, practice the feedback that we were given and practice those action steps. And so whenever it comes to formal feedback, I generally find that uh, quarterly is a good base, uh, base amount. So uh, about three to four times a year uh, looking at um, formalized feedback. When it comes to informal feedback, um, I generally, as a good rule of thumb, look to uh, three to five times a week. Most of the time we're in the office three, um, you know, five times a week. So three to five times a week, I'm giving some sort of feedback informally to my um, team members. Now, of course, this does depend on the actual team members. So there are some team members that desire that daily feedback. Some, some team members desire feedback multiple times a day. And then there are some team members that desire maybe a little bit less. They want to check in, but not that daily feedback. 
And so uh, it's important to uh, really recognize the needs of your team members and then adjust accordingly. So uh, there are some factors to consider whenever deciding the best format of frequency for your organization. But as a general rule, I look at uh, three to four times a year for formal feedback and about three to five times a week for informal feedback. Right. Very interesting because you, uh, you know, you very clearly stated out how many times, you know, somebody should be uh, given a feedback, but, uh, you know, I, w- I wanted to understand how can, you know, performance feedback really help people, uh, especially, you know, Gen Z's and millennials who are rising up in, in, in the ranks of being leaders of these organizations. Uh, and they have a totally different uh, objective than what uh, the boomers of, of the world had. Uh, uh, you know, their cultural values and, and the minds are very different. They're very ambitious, but they uh, have a different need from what boomers have been performing. So how can performance feedback help from, uh, you know, organization set up whereby you have boomers, millennials, Gen Z's, and maybe the next generation uh, also stepping into the workforce? Right. Great question. So, Whenever I look at how we can utilize performance feedback, I first look at the three main purposes of performance feedback. So uh, there are three main purposes. The first is to correct poor behavior or undesired behavior. And um, yeah, so that's behavior that we see that uh, we don't really uh, desire that and we want to correct it. Uh, The next is to reinforce desired behavior. And so this is going to be positive feedback that we then the next is going to be to coach or to improve upon behavior. And once we clearly identify the purpose of the feedback that we are giving, we can then become very specific to get strategic in how we approach the feedback that we give. Uh, Oftentimes I'll see uh, leaders give feedback and they'll say, hey, good job. Well, if we're just saying good job, there's a bit of a ambiguity of, I know I did something right, but what is it that I did right, right? So we're not specific enough that we can get strategic. And so if we can identify the purpose of this feedback is to reinforce this desired behavior, we're able to have a little bit more of a framework to be very specific. So you can say, good job on your initiative in leading this project. Well, now I have clarity that the behavior that I want reinforced is my initiative in leading projects. That's much more specific. And I know clearly what behavior I want, um, you know, is desired to be uh, repeated. And so whether it is Gen Z, whether it's you know, our baby boomers, uh, really identifying the purpose behind your feedback and Um, using that as a framework to be as specific as you can so that you can be strategic in your action is going to be uh, really critical in the way that we utilize feedback for maximum impact. Got it. And and I wanted to understand, you know, for example, there's a company uh, which has around 10,000 people uh, and, you know, they're they're large teams, say a product team, which has 100 100 people, but uh, but the CEO of the company or the C-level executive wants to pass on the message uh, to the entire team uh, and give a feedback to the team members. Would it be okay for the uh, the CEO to give the feedback to the product leader who, who handles around 100 product managers under him and, you know, other people? You know, how how would a, a, a leader of a company, uh, you know, give a feedback to their employees where they're very large teams, you know, for example, 10,000 to 100,000 employees? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, I think first it depends on the nature of the message. Again, if it is to give praise and to give corrective feedback, then maybe something very public would be great. Uh, if there's something that is... Uh, very specific that needs corrected uh, with a specific aspect of the team, uh, then I would approach that a little bit differently. Uh, I'm reminded of a um, a communication guru that I really respect. His name is Dr. Mark Rutland, and he writes that all communication boils down to the right message. So are we crafting our message in the right way at the right time to the right audience in the right way? And so these are four things that we can uh, keep in mind as a leader, 
I would ask myself specifically these questions. Is this the right message that I should be delivering to my team members? And is this the right time to be delivering this message? And this can go from time in the calendar, time of the week, time of the day. Is this the right time to be doing this? Uh, next is the right audience. Are there the right people in the room? And then is this the best way? And the way could be, are you um, giving this information in a meeting? Are you sending an email? Is this a text? <laughs> what, what is your method of communication that we use? And generally, I find that the more emotional the uh, feedback, the more personal that we should be. And so uh, I think that as a leader, it's important to first ask yourself these questions so that you can uh, be very uh, strategic so that you can be effective in the way that you are giving your feedback for best received communication. Right, right. Very nice. And, um, you know, I want to understand, you know, how can a company, uh, you know, create an environment uh, for, for great performance feedback? And, you know, I understand that for the next couple of months or maybe a year, a lot of companies are going to uh, be remotely based. But how do you create that environment of trust uh, where, you know, a leader can can share the feedback and the employee can take that feedback and ensure that, you know, uh, everybody in the company works towards the company's good. Yes. You know, whenever it comes to creating an environment for great performance feedback, I believe it begins with the way that we are setting our performance expectations. So if we have ambiguity in our performance standards and our performance expectations, then there can be a little bit of unclarity in the, in the type of feedback and um, the purpose of the feedback that we are giving. And so whenever I meet with a team, uh, the first thing that we do is we clearly identify what we are doing and why we are doing it. And right. that sounds so simple. Uh, so, but we really do get uh, very clear on this is what success looks like. This is exactly what the expectations are of our team. And this is why this is important. Again, tying that again, uh, into the overall organizational goal. And once you are clear in those expectations and in those standards, you can provide more ownership in the how, because there's not a lot of ambiguity of, I don't know if I did this right. I don't know if this is actually what they were looking for. No, now you know exactly what success looks like and you have, um, and uh, you can have a little bit more ownership in the how you're going to achieve those goals. And so um, in order to really lay that foundation for great performance, we must first be very clear and communicate clearly and often what the expectations are within our team so that we can have clear success metrics. Got it. Makes sense. And do you, do you think in, in future, you know, we'll get a f performance feedback, like how gig workers from Uber and Lyft uh, get rated and they get the feedback in, in a very quick way. I, I don't know if, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I want to gig workers should be, uh, should be put, put across as full-time employees, but, but do you think in, in future, uh, you know, uh, it would be possible for HR leaders or the divisional leaders to get, to rate their employees or to give feedback to their employees in a, in a, in a much quicker way? Um, I, yes, I believe that that is going to be the future of our performance feedback. We as humans are expecting feedback more quickly. Uh, you can see that uh, most clearly exemplified in social media. So I put a post out and within minutes, uh, right. sometimes within seconds, I have immediate feedback. If it's a thumbs up, if it's a thumbs down, uh, what people, uh, what the public is thinking about, you know, these posts. And so uh, we're seeing that a lot in, in social media and that desire is going to overflow within our work feedback as well. Uh, and it could be something as superficial as a thumbs up or a like, or, uh, you know, it could be something as superficial as that. Uh, and then it, we could have a little bit more specific, like a comment in some regard. Uh, I'm finding that there are a lot of various platforms um, that will increase that engagement. And so it can be both virtually and then also physically as well, or 
yeah, in person, uh, there is a desire for quicker feedback. And so leaders and HR leaders are uh, learning how to adjust and meet those desires and those needs. So definitely a desire. I think that the um, tools are already in place to uh, dramatically transform the way that we give feedback at work. It makes sense. And, um, you know, when uh, people focus on the, on the short come and they don't always get to learn, you know, how, how should you give a feedback to an employee who needs to f- uh, focus on, you know, getting an adequate performance, um, uh, um, so that, you know, uh, he performs at the same level, but he doesn't feel slighted, uh, when he gets a feedback about his performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So whenever I come into a team or I start a project, uh, with an organization, The first thing that we do is we have a five to 10 minute conversation that really sets the tone and it's a proactive conversation. And uh, the conversation goes a little something like this. At some point in this project, there's going to be conflict. Uh, There's going to be tension. Uh, There might be shortcomings. And so while our emotions are low now, we've set an expectation that that can happen. And so it really brings the tension off for whenever the shortcomings do occur. Um, We've already normalized conflict. We've already normalized that this is something that can occur. And so while the emotions are low now, let's discuss how we want to handle this situation. And so this is a couple of really powerful things. First, it normalizes conflict. And second off, it provides a game plan. So when this happens, when this happens, we already know what the um, what the script is and how we are going to move forward. And so this puts both the leader at a little bit of ease uh, or can put them at a little bit of ease to address the conflict more um, uh, more confidently. And then also on the receiving end, you've already acknowledged that this is a possibility. Um, and so we can now move forward with that. Now it's important that in this uh, in this time, especially on the giving end, uh, on giving that performance feedback, that we do recognize one of the greatest hurdles to effective performance feedback. That's called the fundamental attribution error. That's just really a fancy way of saying that so oftentimes we acknowledge, uh, we judge other people by their behaviors, and we judge ourselves by our intentions, and. So with that, we might see this on the road often. We uh, see someone that is driving around and we think, oh my gosh, they're terrible drivers. They cut me off. They should have their keys taken away. Um, You know, and so we we look at their behavior. But if we accidentally cut someone off uh, within our driving, we think, oh, I didn't mean to. Uh, I didn't see that the lane change was coming. And, And we start looking at our intentions and And so we see this in organizations quite often. And so one major coaching point that I give leaders whenever we are addressing these shortcomings is first I ask, what was your intention whenever you uh, behaved in that manner? And so we look at the intention and we look at the behavior. And now we have approached the shortcoming as a knowledge gap. Um, And so we're able to really go into more of a coaching role in, okay, here's your intention, here's the behavior. How can we bring the two a little bit closer together? Uh, As you said before, I have a background as a sports coach. And if I reprimanded or uh, tried to address every single time that my players took a shot um, on goal, I was a football coach. A soccer coach. If I if I reprimanded that every time, then uh, there would be a little bit of a disconnect. And what in, instead I see that they are shooting to try to score a goal. And uh, if they miss, then I'm able to see their intention, see the behavior, and then coach closer to bring the two together. And so that's really um, a some powerful tools that I use that really aren't dramatic shifts in the communication, but slight pivots that can set the stage for addressing shortcomings and then also being very strategic and entering into more of a coaching manner in improving those uh, that performance and to really effectively address those shortcomings. 
right? No, that was, that was a great answer. And, uh, you know, you, you talked about judgments uh, and, you know, human beings usually have judgments and that, that is where my next question falls on it. You know, we, we, we usually have a lot of biases and, and a lot of humans, uh, you know, we generally have confirmation biases because of the kind of environments we've grown up and, and the environment we're around. You know, how can a leader avoid, you know, gender or other biases while, while giving a feedback to, uh, to somebody in their team? Yeah. So I find that whenever we address bias feedback, there are two major forms that those biases can take place. And, uh, the first is in your content and what the actual feedback is. And then the next is in the approach. Uh, so whenever we uh, talk about the approach, uh, we have to understand that biases stem from stereotypes. And we rely on these generalizations and biases when we don't know other people as well. And so we rely on these generalizations as a crutch for uh, our ignorance. And uh, we rely on these generalizations to aid us in the unknown. So uh, what I first encourage leaders to do is to actually get to know the people in your team so that you can accommodate your feedback in your approach. See, avoiding biases does not mean that you ignore the fact that people are different. It means that you acknowledge it and you accommodate accordingly. Uh, so I work with the team and I work with several teams and I have some team members that might be a little bit more uh, sensitive. I have some that might want a little bit more direct feedback. Uh, I have some that want public praise, some want uh, personalized individual private praise. And so uh, what I do is I truly get to know the individuals so that I can, um, rather than rely on those generalizations, I can rely on my personal relationship with the individual. Right. So that's that's the major um, approach that I take on the um, on the approach wise of giving feedback. Now, content wise, uh, the best way I believe to have crystal clear, unbiased, um, unbiased performance feedback is to have crystal clear performance metrics. And so, having a judgment of uh, I don't really know if they met my expectation. Well, if you didn't communicate your expectation, then there's already a bit of ambiguity there. So looking at the performance metrics, if you already have crystal clear expectations and standards, then that takes out um, some of the room and the ambiguity for personal biases and personal judgment. And so it's very clear, this is the metrics, did they meet the metrics? And so, um, yeah, just be as clear as possible in defining those standards proactively that can um, take out some of that room for uh, unconscious bias and conscious bias uh, within the content of our performance feedback. Uh, well, very, very rightly pointed out that you know a person needs to know the metrics and and the expectations uh, before you know they get onto the job. And uh, you know when it comes to performance feedback, uh, you know it is also important that a leader. Uh, also, you know, gives the feedback and takes the feedback from their team. So, you know, how should a leader, uh, you know, take feedback uh, uh, from their team so that, you know, he can also improve as a leader and, you know, uh, he can take it in a, in a positive intent? I, I think that some of the answer was in your question in that the leader is looking for feedback to improve. And so and not just looking for feedback and, right. oh, something that I have to do. They tell me that this is important. No, if you're looking at feedback that you are receiving as an opportunity to improve, then you're already one step ahead of, of some. So uh, first off, having the right mindset is critical. Uh, but really, uh, being a good receiver of feedback, if you want your organization to be good receivers of feedback, it does begin with leadership. And that comes with the... Um, you know, the true vulnerability to be in a place to trust your team. Um, so that, that trust is going to be exemplified through your vulnerability, through your authenticity, and to truly listen to feedback. And so I um, really encourage leaders in that time to truly sit, um, uh, truly sit and listen to the feedback that is being given. And then actively look for action steps. So even though, and so this comes again to the fundamental attribution error, even though you may think 
Paul, well, this is this is really my intention here. This is the behavior that the team is seeing. This is the feedback that is being given. And so again, even approach that from a coaching aspect and from a learning aspect of, okay, this is what my intention is as a leader. This is how I'm wanting to lead the company. What is the uh, perception of my behavior? And are the two in alignment? And so I would uh, really take a moment to be authentic with your team. Uh, truly trust your team to give um, honest feedback and be vulnerable in that time. And also be prepared to take action. Uh, right. So uh, I find that honestly, one of the largest inhibitors to a leader receiving feedback is a lack of action. In fact, I was leading a team several years ago and we were getting ready to have a mass um, a survey we were, where we were going to receive a lot of feedback. I kind of looked at our organization. I knew that in the next month or two, we weren't going to be in a position of that to take action, but in a month or two, we would be. So in two months, we were going to be in a place to take action. So instead we said, okay, we're going to delay a couple months because we know that once we receive this feedback, we want to be able to take action and show that your voice is being heard. And so uh, it's important to uh, be prepared to show some sign that you have heard the feedback and that it is valued, that this feedback isn't just lost in the wind, but right. that there is a true reception and action being taken. And um, so in some, in some organizations I've worked with, it could be something just very small, uh, but it does show we we have our voice has been heard um so it so find some way in the feedback that you are being given a way to exemplify that the voice has been heard and that your insight is not discredited and that it's not dismissed and um that it really has the power to impact change so i think that that's uh, yeah, a great way for leaders to approach that feedback. Absolutely, and uh, taking action on the feedback uh, alone, I think uh, that could that could really lead to better performance from the leader and from the team itself. And uh, you know, Amber, I understand that delivering happiness is is one of your uh, one of the books that you 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 suggest. But do you think there's any any company which is follow the right uh, you know culture principles and and they and they uh, give that uh, sort of a feedback to uh, to their team and inside the company any any company uh, whom you uh, whom you've followed and, and you know you would uh, suggest to listeners uh, uh, about your suggestion mm, yes yeah uh, so the book that we discussed earlier uh, delivering happiness is actually a book about zappos, zappos which yeah. i be- i believe they might be international i think they might just be american uh, but it's a shoe delivery company. And right. so you can yeah. order shoes online and then they can deliver your shoes. And they are uh, very well known for their intentionality in creating a culture and uh, giving the very valuable feedback to their teams and to their organization. Uh, another company that I really respect and admire the way that they um, address their feedback uh, would also have to be uh, Disney and the way that. Uh, especially within their amusement parks. And so they have a very clear feedback system uh, that they give to their employees so that they can continuously improve uh, in on, on every aspect of the organization. So on an individual level, on a, um, on a team level, on a department level, on an organizational level. So they, they look at this uh, multi, uh, on, on multiple different levels. Um, so I do, I do really respect the way that they uh, take an approach uh, with that. And, and I apologize, I'm going to do one more uh, extra one, but there is a company cool. called, uh, there's a company called Hilti and uh, they are an international right. company and uh, they actually have a person that they, they call their Sherpa, uh, they suffer, uh, you know, the Nepalese uh, Sherpas and uh, oh, they, yeah come in and they uh, have a true conversation to say, okay, what are we doing well? Uh, what are we 
Um, what can we improve? And they have kind of a stay interview. So rather than exit interviews, uh, kind of more of a stay interview and say, um, you know, what can we do to help you uh, succeed within this organization? And so they look at it as more of a service facing uh, front and how they can serve their employees. And uh, that is a great way to build a culture of trust within Thanks. your organization and also to lay the foundation for really uh, authentic and sincere conversations. Got it. Yeah. Zappos, Disney, uh, and are great examples. Um, Amber, I quickly want to do that top three. What's your favorite business book or, or fiction or nonfiction book? Mm. Uh, one of my favorite business books is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Uh, right. Basically, all of his books are very good, but he does a really good job of outlining yeah, the five dysfunctions of a team and how we can progress and move forward as an organization. I'll put that in the show notes. And uh, do you follow any HR leader or CEO whom you admire, uh, which listeners should also know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a couple uh, great um, yeah, HR leaders that I follow is um, John Cotter. Is, uh, he's an author, but he is a great thought leader when it comes to leading change within, in organizations. As an HR leader, that's something that we're constantly doing is leading change. And so he has a lot of really good insights into how to strategically do that from a 30,000 foot view. And then he gets into the weeds. And so uh, I really engage a lot into his thoughts and his readings as well. And, and, and is there any piece of advice you, would you want to give to HR, uh, young HR leaders who want to grow the careers in, in, in the HR industry? You know, the biggest aspect of my growth as an HR person comes from my network. And right. so honestly, if I, I tell young leaders this all the time, if you can achieve your dreams all on your own, then you're probably not dreaming big enough. You need to include more people than yourself if you want to go beyond just yourself. And so uh, I really encourage you to continue to uh, reach out to your network. Uh, it's easier to network now more than ever. We have online platforms like LinkedIn. We have associations, especially on the HR world. We have associations like SHRM and ATD. And uh, there are people in this community that really want to help you grow and succeed. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to talk. Um, and uh, we can. Uh, and so that that network and that resource is going to be the most valuable thing that you can do. Uh, more than the books, more than a, anything else, having uh, quality mentors in your life is going to be really uh, powerful for you to continue to improve um, as an HR professional. Right. Um, uh, Amber, you've, you've worked in uh, in the corporate world before, and now uh, you run your own startup, which is Ninja Group. What bit you the uh, entrepreneurial bug, and, and what are you trying to solve uh, through Ninja, Ninja Group? Yeah, so uh, the Ninja Group, as I said, is uh, really here to help uh, build organizations. So we deal with performing teams that might struggle with things such as coworker tension and um, and a lack of performance feedback and miscommunication and a lack of collaboration. And we work with teams in a fun and a powerful way so that we can uh, make work more enjoyable, more effective. Um, and really produce the best product and the best service. And so uh, our whole goal is to uh, work with teams so that we can perform at a higher level. And so that's uh, kind of where, where we are at, at the Ninja Group. We have a variety of different services from consulting to keynotes to workshops. Uh, we have some online resources. Um, our, our whole goal is to really help you uh, be successful. All right, Amber, uh, we'll put that in the show notes. What is the best way people can reach out to you and know more about uh, about you and Ninja Group? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Amber Vanderberg. Uh, you can also look up the Ninja Group, which will be in the show notes at theninjagroup.org. Um, and yeah, those are the two ways to best reach out to me. And um, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Awesome. Uh, uh, Amber, thank you so much for taking your time and speaking to us. I really enjoyed speaking to you and I was busy writing the notes the whole time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. 
is do subscribe to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for new episodes.